acutely aware of how actually much that soundtrack sounds like parts of the Caribbean when you've heard it a couple of times. I haven't got a clicker. Can I grab a clicker? Oh, perfect, perfect. Thank you very much. And also acutely aware of the fact that I'm probably the only one in the room wearing a mechanical watch because you're all very new media, aren't you? So does anyone have a mechanical watch in the audience? Well, there's a few. That's a few. That's good. They're very eco-friendly. Um, uh, I watch, obviously, you've probably been every every sort of two years or so, but a mechanical watch should theoretically last forever if you have it serviced. So uh, that's the benefit. Um, what I thought I'd talk to you a little bit today is, I mean, it's very much about building a brand. Um, uh, we started Bremont back in 2002, and it's a little bit about the journey, how we got there, how we started, um, and indeed, sort of any questions afterwards. Um, but it started actually much further back than 2002. This chap here was our, our father. So I co-founded this with my brother, Giles, um, who's a couple of years younger than me. And uh, this chap here is our father. We spent a huge amount of time as we grew up uh, in the workshop with him. He's an incredible aeronautical engineer, Cambridge, where he read, um, oh, he did a PhD there, six years there. But he was so curious about all things mechanical. So we spent the whole time you know, restoring old motorbikes, planes, um, uh, cars. One, one of the things he was very passionate about was, um, was clocks, and that's where our interest became uh, in all things mechanical. So you have um, you know, anything that you could tinker with in the workshop, that was us. Um, the other big passion, which definitely came down through, the, through, through him, was, was flying. Um, so all three of us were sponsored the university by the Air Force. Um, he did a lot of display flying, and as we grew up, we were lucky enough to to a bit of display flying as well. So in our teens, we'd go off and, um, well, actually, when we're this young size, we'd sit in the back of an airplane like that so nobody could see us, and we'd do the air shows without the Civil Aviation Authority seeing us. As we grew up a bit, we started doing them ourselves. Um, and then our lives changed quite a lot in 1995. Um, I hadn't flown my father for a, for a long, long time, um, probably a year or so. And it was one beautiful sort of March day. And he said, look, why don't, we, um, why don't we go for a fly? My brother had gone up to the airfield early that day. And we're off to do some sort of formation practice, similar to the sort of pitch you see there. Um, and sort of things, things didn't go as planned that day. And uh, we had an accident. And the tipping point for us, and I, our father died, um, I ended up, I was in the sort of front seat there. I ended up breaking 30-odd bones and going into a hospital for, for many, many months. And my brother was sort of flying beside, saw the whole thing sort of happen and, and heard it on the radio and stuff, which was pretty horrific. Um, so I'm actually half metal now. I've got a lot of metal bits inside me. Uh, so going through uh, airport security is always a bit of a bummer. Um, but it, it was for us, um, it was that tipping point. And, you know, uh, I think it changes. When an event like that happens, it does change the way you think about things. So um, for my sins, after, uh, after I left university, I, um, I always thought I was going to join the Air Force. And it was, uh, I remember asking my father, you know, what shall I do? And actually, if you join the Air Force in the early 90s, I'm giving my age now, early 90s, um, it was a three or four year waiting list before you learned to fly. Um, and I was very impatient. And I said, OK, I'm going to go and do something different. So I went into the city. Charles and I both went into corporate finance. And I remember sitting down, um, I'd had the accident, and about a year later, I was sitting down, and I'd just been working all night, as you do in the city. And my boss, who was 10 years older than me, sort of about 20 stone, you know, sweating profusely on his third wife, you know, extra big mortgage, that sort of thing, came in, and he said, Nick, you're doing a bloody good job here. Um, in 10 years' time, you could be where I am. And I remember just looking at this guy going, <laughs> So, so I rang up my brother and I said, Giles, I'm thinking of quitting. And he rang me back 10 minutes later and said, I've quit. So the next, the, the next, the next problem there was, oh my gosh, what am I going to tell my mother? Um, and we left. And um, we, there he is. Um, and we got involved in the business of restoring aircraft for a while. And it was, it was a bit like therapy. Um, it was maintaining and restoring these old wartime aircraft, which is a big passion of ours. And it helped us... Um, I suppose to fuse a whole and understand exactly what had gone on the years beforehand. But the back of this is this huge passion for watches. So I don't know if anyone's into mechanical watches quite as much as I am, but the, um, there is this amazing history of, uh, of watchmaking in this country. So if you go back 100, 
odd years, turn of last century, 60%, because you think of Switzerland, don't you? you th everyone thinks of Switzerland, you think of watches, but the world sets its time by Greenwich. Um, it, uh, you know, if you go back, um, let me say, to the 1700s, the first ship's chronometer was built by a, a Yorkshireman, a carpenter Yorkshireman, who won this incredible competition set by the British Admiralty, where he would go off and uh, find, work out a solution for telling the time at sea. You could, you could tell um, you know, latitude using stars or sun, but longitude, you needed, you needed time. And John Harrison was the chap who came up with that. But the 120 years ago, 60% of the world's pocket watches and clocks came from you know, this country, Clerkenwell and places like that. So there is this incredible um, uh, active that happened on this, these British shores. And then what happened is, you, I guess you had two world wars. So if you could build a, you know, a movement part, um, that's the sort of part inside the, the watch, um, you could probably build a you know, machine, anything out of metal. So you'd pull into all sorts of different different industries from planes, guns, you could build a firing pin for an infill rifle, whatever it was. And the, and the industry gradually shrunk. And then, um, obviously, as the interwar years, there was a depression and so forth, and then with the Second World War, when it really was all hands on deck. And during this time, Switzerland remained remarkably independent and uh, sold watches to everyone, which uh, sort of helped destroy us. So the last company, I guess, in, in this country to, to make watches, uh, mechanical watches, um, was probably Smith um, in the 1960s, and then they have finally died out with the Quartz Revolution. But your machining part, so a big part of what Bremont's very much about is bringing back watchmaking to this UK. That is our passion, that's our number one. Hopefully you talk to anyone at Bremont and say, what are, what are you about? And you'd cut them half, it'd be like a stick of rocket and say, we make watches in the UK. And this is, um, you know, there's a lot of easier places to make watch parts, a lot cheaper places to make watch parts, but this is our sort of, uh, our, our number one mission. And um, we're, is that, this is the new place we're building now, um, which is just outside Henley, so we've got two facilities at the moment. So if you go to Henley, you'll see this at the moment. We're not quite there. This is um, supposed to be ready July next year. Um, but if you're, you're machining parts to, so human hair is 50, 60 microns, you're machining to probably three or four microns consistently. So you have a machine probably quarter the size of this room um, doing nothing but making a part, you know, a minute part. Um, the in-house movement, everyone talks about Swiss movements. So we've been working for several years uh, the in-house movement in the UK, which again is um, a big passion of ours, working with an incredible chap, a British chap who is uh, world renowned. Um, and this will be a big, big, big turning point for us. But a lot of it comes down to, to training. Um, you know, where do you find watchmakers in the UK? It's, um, it's kind of next to impossible. So obviously we pinched a few from people to begin with, as you do. Um, but that was many, many years ago. And since then, the last decade, it's all about training up. So if you want to be a watchmaker in the UK, you, um, you'll come to Bremont and you will generally sit down and you'll do a bit of apprenticeship. So we're all very much into apprenticeships. Um, um, I'd love to see the sort of polys and the universities and the polys go back to doing more vocational stuff because it's so, so important. And we're missing engineers, we're missing um, you know, technicians, we're missing people who want to make a career out of, of things like watchmaking. And we work with some incredible organizations like the Advanced Manufacturing Research Center. If any of you should go up to um, Sheffield to go and have a look, it's the most phenomenal setup. Um, twinned with a university and, I mean, it's a great statistic. 15 years ago, it's the cheapest real estate, um, industrial real estate in Europe, just on the slag heaps of, of uh, where the old coal mines were in Sheffield. Now it's the most expensive. You've got Rolls-Royce jet engines, you've got Jaguar, you've got um, McLaren, you've got uh, Boeing was a founding partner. It is an incredible one. You've got 400 PhD and apprentices up there, all from, uh, all from the UK. Um, then you've got little things like British School of Watchmaking, which is tiny, and we sort of help subsidize that. Um, but we're hoping that, you know, with time, this will change. Um, so when, when we started Bremont, it was very much, uh, you know, we weren't Swiss. We so weren't Swiss. And every, there were several, Giles and I, started, there were 700, I think, 730-odd Swiss watch brands when we started, um, and very few British. There's a couple of very special artisanal watchmakers making 10 watches a year. But what we wanted to do is something fairly different. So for, our authenticity was key. So when we started the brand, we didn't want to buy a brand. It was very much 
let's start Bromium from scratch. Um, we wanted to produce something which was beautifully, beautifully engineered, so the product would stand on its own two feet, which is the, you know, you've got to have a product that works. Obviously, you can try and build the best brand in the world, but if you don't have a good product to start with, you're kind of um, on a hiding to nothing. Um, but it, we had to, we didn't want to trade on someone else's history. I showed you that list of, of brands beforehand, which, um, you know, incredible, you know, Harrison's brand was available when we started. Um, and that would have been amazing to have, but at the same time, it wasn't us, it wasn't our history. And I think you've got to create your own history if you're starting from scratch. Um, so we, we see ourselves competing with ourselves in a way. Um, we're trying to, obviously Switzerland's out there, but our offering is very, very different. We're not trying to say we're a Swiss watch, we're a British watch, and that, that does make a difference. Um, the whole bit about doing things differently was very, very important to us from very early on. So our strategy, our sort of, Giles and I, we sat down and we said, what is our, um, you know, attitude to investment, for example. So when we, um, Giles and I set up, the thing, there's two ways of looking at investment in, in anything you do, in machinery. Uh, you can sit down, you can do your incredible return investment model where you think, okay, is this gonna work? What's the payback on this? And, or you can just say, actually, let's just have a go. And what are the downside? What is the downside of doing it? Um, so my brother and I set up this thing, we nicknamed, and we got the nickname from a mate of ours called the Fuck It Fund, where you just put money in and without the board knowing, and we'd try stuff. And if it worked, we'd come up and say, yeah, we thought about this uh, a lot, and this is the way we should go forward. And we started doing a lot of new development based on that. It's been very, very effective. Um, the product itself, we, when we came up with it, had to be very, very different. Um, so we had um, new ways of, and I'll talk about it in a minute, but this, this product you see there um, is new way, it's a completely new way of, of housing a watch movement inside a watch. The steel was seven times harder than normal stainless steel. And, I can, I'll see your glaze over in a minute, but it was very, very geeky in the watch market, and that really helped. But also we turned it on its, you know, the way we marketed ourselves, we turned it a little bit on its head. So every watch brand was going to a place called Basel in Switzerland. And four years ago, we pulled out and said, actually, it's a Swiss watch show, let's do something ourselves, let's do it differently. You have to do things differently, especially if you're sort of the, the minnow against the LVMHs, the Swatches, and the, the Richemonts, and the Gucci group, and all those sort of people. So we, we went and did a Bremel townhouse. Every year we hire a big building in the UK and we just do things differently. And you fly people in and they suddenly you have their time. Instead of having 20 minutes with a journalist at Basel, you had them for the whole day or two and you can take them to Henley and show them around. Our watch stores, we have a number of our own stores. Uh, we sell through you know, a couple of hundred others, you know, the watch of Switzerland, and selfish people around the world. But the, um, our own stores, instead of just having glass and metal and, and doing the things that every brand, watch brand was doing, it was actually let's put a bar in there. Um, and let's make it more club-like. And uh, I'll show you in a minute how, that, how effective that was. Um, but also early days, this was actually quite relevant to you guys, but you know, 10 years ago, no luxury brand was doing social media. How would we, as a brand that had effectively started 2007, our first watch, so my, the worst thing my brother and I did when we started in 2002 was going well, telling our wives, saying, look, darlings, it's going to be a year and a half before you see the first watch. And five years later, we still hadn't uh, delivered the first watch because it took a lot longer than we thought. Um, but in 2007, when we were ready, how do you get the message out around the world? And nobody in the luxury market was, it was vulgar. Social media was completely vulgar. Um, so we took it on. And it, it, was, um, it was the way we grew the brand in America and Asia and Middle East. And it was very, very important to us. But also, you embrace this incredible, these reality shots of people doing amazing things. All around. Everyone's doing it now. But um, for us, it, it really did make a big, big difference. Um, the, other, the other sort of brand, um, how do you say it? I suppose the brand pillar for us is this, this adventure. Um, so it's about producing a beautifully engineered watch. So we love Macauka watches. We love vintage watches. You know, our father had an old collection of watches, which we still have to this day. And they meant so much to us back then. And they still do now. Um, in hindsight, they're all a bit ropey. You know, and there's nothing particularly special, but they all have an incredible story attached. And they mean so much to us. But they're all very fragile. We want to produce a Macauka watch, which was, yeah, beautifully engineered, but very, very robust. So it came down to putting these watches on amazing people doing amazing things when we started, and that sort of carried on there. So the whole our motto is sort of tested beyond endurance. So I don't know if you've been following people like NIMS. 
NIMS is currently climbing the 14 highest mountains in the world, over 8,000 meters. The current record stands at eight years. He's done 12 in six months at the moment. Um, his ex SBS ex uh, Gurkha, um, what he's doing is phenomenal. But you know, he's taking the watches with him. You've got you know, people like Foxy on SBS. You've got uh, Jake, who's just uh, you know, climbed K2, and you've got Ben Saunders there, who you know, recreated Scott through it. These people are doing amazing things, um, but also testing watches. I think our first ambassador was um, uh, Charlie Borman, Charlie and Ewan, going up a um, long way down on their motorbikes, but four months on a motorcycle. We learned a huge amount from that. Um, I'm trying to figure out why our PR girls picked Ross Edgley, but, um, the, uh, um, but there are some amazing people doing some amazing things. And based on that, we also have a thing called, uh, I'll show you in a minute, Bremont Adventurers Club, where these guys come in every month and talk to us. Um, just carrying on the whole adventure spirit, this is my brother. Um, this is a few years after my accident. So you can imagine my mother by this time is getting slightly tetchy about us going flying. So if any of you want to come flying with us, um, <laughs> do, do let us know, because we still do quite a lot. Um, he's fine, though. Um, there he is. No, but his phone, look. The watch was fine. But his phone wasn't. That's the different disposable technology. There you go. Um, there he is. He's fine there. Um, he broke his back in a few places. Um, the, other, the other pillar for our brand is this, this aviation military thing. Um, so probably a third of our business now is military around the world. But it came from, um, from work uh, we'd done with um, some incredible squadrons. But also, I suppose our DNA, we had to have make these brand pillars very obvious. And the aviation military one. And you've got some incredible people, several hundred squadrons around the world using these, these watches. And again, for social media and for, for just pure marketing pleasure, you get some incredible, you know, this is 80,000 feet over somewhere um, in a U-2 spy plane. And there are some really, really cool images. And the military has continued. We do a lot with the armed forces. Things, um, Invictus is a big part of our, you know, of our charitable side. Um, uh, you do, you know, the, armed for the only watch brand to the Armed Forces Covenant. And again, there's some amazing stories, amazing stories come out from these incredible people. Um, this is quite a nice thing for the brand. It was all about um, working directly with the Ministry of Defense and Her Majesty's Armed Forces to produce a mechanical watch. The last military mechanical watch made was probably in the 60s again. So this is quite a lovely thing for the sort of history books of Bremont to be doing. Um, but um, you know, what is our mission? And what is, so I think Giles and I, if we can look back in 20 years' time and what was Bremont about, for us it would have been able to say we played a small part in the reinvigoration of watchmaking in this country. Um, it'd be lovely to be able to walk away and say, actually, you know, there's more watch brands. And already there's sort of more brands starting in the UK, which is fantastic. And we need, you know, in, in Switzerland, the market's very horizontally integrated with lots of people doing different things. And it, it fosters more and more um, uh, more, I suppose more and more um, business in that area, and that's what we're trying to do now. But going through all of this, the thing that really st stuck out, and I think um, Paulina was mentioning it earlier, this whole thing about customer satisfaction is absolutely clear. So, so important for us. Getting the customer in the first place is, is exactly what Paulina was saying, is just a tiny bit. It's, the, it's how you look after them afterwards. And it is about take this person, making them feel immensely special. Um, you, you've got to make them feel like rock stars, really. You really do. And when they buy them, so we do various things, like these adventurers clubs, where people can come along, where I talk to you. So you might have a Bear Girls coming and talking. You might have a, you know, Charlie. You might have um, Ian Callum, chief designer of Jaguar, and Aston Martin coming along and talking about adventure and design. Anyone, actually, Giles and I find interesting, you get along. Um, but it is really important, and is again, <laughs> point you could have written my speech. This is um, people do connect with people. It's not about after the product. It's about interaction, and that's one of the most important, important parts. And you suddenly become part of this this Bremont family. And so CRM for us was really, really important from day one, and how we how we communicate with our um, with our, or our client customer base, and again from that partnerships, etc. And these are our stores. Um, but it is a bloody complex business. You're looking at, um, you know, we're a design company at one end, um, but you're in a market company. You're, you're, we're sitting down designing this product. 
you're then, you know, you're machining. So you go and you'll see a bar of metal in Henley going in and these parts coming out. You're manufacturing the part, you're trying to put them together. Um, you're retailing. So you own your own stores and you're trying to, you're trying to work on how, how, you, how you run these stores and staffing and displays, all the marketing material there. But then at the end of the day, you are a marketing company. You can have the best brand in the world, but if people don't know about you, um, again, you're, it's not going to do brilliantly. Um, so we do put a lot of emphasis on that. And, and I think these are sort of the key things for me that really stood out is I think for any brand when you're starting, the passion has to be there. And I think people can detect, can't they? My wife can always detect when I'm lying. And, um, and I think it's the same with your customers. And I think you've got to know, they've got to know that passion's real. Um, the authenticity I talked about earlier on is important. And especially now, everybody knows everything. On the internet, people go in and they're asking questions which 10 years ago, they wouldn't have had a clue. And you've got to have these glass, you know, these glass walls where everyone can look in, which is why we're building that new facility. So people come along and kick the tires. I want to know where that, you know, say you made in England, I want to see where that part is actually made. And there's not a sort of shipment coming around the back from somewhere else. And that's really, really important. Um, and that, obviously, we all have to be smart. That's quite important. But the, the innovation is really, really important. And for us, the thing that really, I think we, differentiated ourselves from certainly the majority of brands when we started with this was this ability to tell stories so a watch is a watch for most people it's round it's normally with three hands it tells the time but what is the difference between that brand if you go into self she's going to watch the switzerland there may be 40 brands there but why would someone go for your brand um and it's about telling stories and one of our very early storytelling exercises came from uh, this partnership here with Martin Baker. You probably saw Jimmy Fallon with that watch with the red barrel earlier on. You can only get that watch if you've ejected from an aircraft. Um, this, this company, Martin Baker, makes 70% of the world's fighter ejection seats. And they came to us um, about 12 years ago and said, look, if you eject from one of our aircraft, you get a really ropey tie and you get a, like a badge. And nobody wears a tie. To I'm going to make sure I always insult someone. When, and these ties look like they could go up in flames at any moment. Um, and they said it would be really nice if we could design a watch with them, which um, they would subsidize. But you can only get, again, as I said, if you're ejected. So we said, great. But they said, yeah, but the watch has got to go through the, through the same testing of the ejection seats themselves. And these ejection seats might sit in an aircraft for 40 years. Uh, they might be in, on an aircraft carrier. They might be in Nevada you know, with the heat. They might be in... Uh, Alaska, they'll be at 80,000 feet, they'll be landing on an aircraft carrier with salt fog, there'll be all these different scenarios. And the watch, they've got the most incredible environmental testing facility. So we started putting our watches through this and they were destroyed. And we were going, oh dear, we promised we'd be able to deliver this thing. And our technical director at the time said, actually, we've got to, let's come up with this idea of suspending the movement inside the watch in a special suspension mount. And we did it and they started passing. And that's what led to all of our military work. It was telling this story about, wow, this is a mechanical watch, but it's immensely robust. And the whole story, and they've saved 7,600 lives to date. It's a British company based near Denham, M25, M40. And it is just the most incredible place to go and see. So that was a bit of a story. Obviously, Jaguar, we've worked with for 10, 12 years. I fell in love because he's such a brilliant guy. Ian Callum, the chief designer, where he came from Aston Martin. We designed the DB7, the 9, the Vanquish. Um, this Bond villain car at the bottom, but they, and we, and we did various lovely projects with him. Um, we've just done, actually done an Aston Martin thing with him as well. Um, but we, um, we ended up designing, you know, the clocks, the Royal Jaguars, and uh, uh, ended up with a line of watches for, for Jaguar. But again, it was a storytelling. It was about working with this new um, continuation lightweight E-type, and press needs stories to write about. Otherwise, again, it's a round watch with three hands. America's Cup was another good one. It's the first British timer since 1865 to be involved with the America's Cup. But just to finish off, the, one of the, you know, the watches themselves, um, how do you tell a story? And, and we started, again, in 2000, I think it's 2008, we started with our first watch, which they all had a charity. We'll do one limited edition in the year with a charitable angle on it. And the money goes to charity, and it's... Um, uh, something quite special. It's basically historical, and it's, again, whatever Giles and I find interesting. And it started with these two watches here, both built with very famous parts of aircraft in the a P-51 and a Spitfire from very famous ones from the Second World War. And 
when they came out, they were at sort of six grand. Now they go for about 26,000 pounds. So they've gone up in value. And now you're, you know, this one here, Cobreaker, we, we work with Bletchley Park, and that's got original parts of Ligma Machine built into the, the movement and part of Alan Trin's hut in the crown. And, but from the front, it just looks like a beautiful watch. But from the back, it tells a whole story. HMS Victory, original copper and uh, wood oak that was at the Battle of Trafalgar, as certified by the first sea lord. Again, monies went to the restoration of the ship. And this is probably one of the, the most exciting ones. This had original fabric from the 1903 Wright Flyer, Alvin Wilbur Wright's first ever aircraft. Um, so he met up with the Wright family, and it was all about restoring the Dayton family home in, um, in Ohio. Um, but they're stories, and obviously the product's got to keep up with the story itself. But if you combine the two, and we only do one of these uh, once a year, and our launch, I think, for this year's is in a couple of weeks' time. But we've done them with BA. You probably saw that Concorde one, the last flying Concorde. Um, and it's, you know, it's storytelling plays a big, big, big part. Last couple of slides. Um, obviously, movies help. Uh, makes a big, big difference. So if you can get in the movies, um, Kingsman was a, was a big thing for us um, because it's suddenly eyeballs all over the world. It's not just in, you know, in, in a magazine in the UK. Um, Tom with his um, Venom. Um, and there you go. A few Bremont spotted there. Um, there you go. I'm acutely aware of time there, but I've got, I'm here for as many questions as you like. So um, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Pleasure. Yeah, we've got a few few questions coming in. Um, thank you very much. That was very entertaining, very enjoyable, entertaining, and, and very interesting and inspiring as well. So thank you for sharing the story. Pleasure. Absolutely pleasure. Uh, lots of questions have come in, um, so you're going to be a busy man outside because we, no, we will need to wrap course. up. But I'm going to ask you a few. Yeah, uh, please. Uh, a couple of people have asked, what is the origin of the name Bremont, um, and how do you assess the no doubt many adventurers that come to you for sponsorship? Okay. Um, Two questions there. So the adventurers quickly, that is obviously doing something quite, quite special. There are quite a few people doing special things. Um, and these special things get more and more special as time goes on. I don't know how these adventurers come up with the next thing. And, and there's some pretty crazy things you mm -hmm. get. Um, but I think our general rule is, who do you enjoy working with? I think our longest serving ambassadors are the ones that are just really nice people. Right. Um, and I know that sounds a bit lame, but they are. And they've all become really good friends in themselves yep. because life's a bit short to work with. <laughs> you clearly yeah. enjoy what you do. That so, so, so there's... The Bremont name. The, so Bremont name. Um, when I talk about authenticity at the beginning, we didn't want to buy a brand. And having a surname like English was, um, you know, <laughs> slightly hard to trademark. And an English watch company, would have been, the irony would have been lost on a lot of people. So two years after my father's accident or my accident, Giles and I, Giles got me back up in the air quite quickly, right. um, you know, metal arms and stuff. And uh, as kids, we we're very fortunate. We'd go off and we'd fly. Um, our, our, my parents gave us a huge amount of um, kind of responsibility for quite a young age. So I'd be 17, Giles would be 15, and our summer holiday would be going off a 1940s airplane uh, with the stipulation off to Europe and by ourselves with a stipulation that we rang mum once a week just to tell her where we are. <laughs> so you'd cross the channel following the ferry, hoping it was going from Dover to Calais and it'd be going to Ostend or something. And then you re And we're doing another one of these trips two years after, and we had a forced landing in a field in France. And if you do that in America or um, England even, you buy the farmer a bottle of whiskey and take mm -hmm. his wife for a flight and everything's very easy. And France is very, very bureaucratic. So we landed in this pea field. And the chap who came out to help us, um, Giles went hitchhiking with a rather good-looking French woman to get some fuel. <laughs> I was left pushing this airplane in a, in a <laughs> hangar with a 78-year-old um, man who we stayed with for three days. And had our father lived another 30 years, our father's 49 when he died. Right. Um, had he lived another 30, this was our father. He used to fly, had a workshop full of parts. It was just... And his name was Antoine Bremont. Right. So when it came to uh, naming the brand, for the first three years of making Bremont, we didn't have a name. It just had watch written on it. Because right. that wasn't important to us. It was about getting the product <laughs> right. But uh, So that's where it came from. Very good. A good story. Um, when you're working in the city, someone said, in 10 years' time, if you work hard, you'll be. Where will you, where will you be in 10 years from now? Where will Bremont be in 10 years from now? 
Do you know, it's really hard. I think this, this new facility is very exciting. I mean, it really, and please, you must all, July, it's open. If you ever want to come out and have a look, it's quite exciting. Um, is that an open invite for everyone here? It is, it is indeed. No, seriously, because it. it's, um, it's, quite, it's quite interesting. And I love seeing, you know, engineering in this country. Um, you know, I think it's a bit of more of the same. I would love to, um, uh, obviously, we make about 12,000 watches a year, but, you know, this is designed to make a chunk more than that. Right. Um, and I think if you can grow, and I'd like just walking around and seeing more people having learnt the trade, so to speak, is, mm -hmm. is very, very special. And uh, so a bit of more of the same, really. And that movement is a big, big project. Right, it's okay. like building a whole new engine. So. Someone has asked a, a slight um, cheeky question. But how much do watchmakers make, and can they work from home? <laughs> can they work from home? Home is difficult, actually. I tell you, it's because there's so much we have. Um, so this new place has got, um, for example, has positive air pressure for dust. It has special filters. It has um, and the equipment for testing. You have, you know, testers that go down to two kilometers for water pressure and all that. It's quite hard. It's a lot yeah. of expense. Some do occasionally, you know, but not really, not really, no, unless they have incredible setup. Um, how do they, you know, they can range from, I suppose, 20 to 60 grand, you know, upwards, you, you know, they, they, depending on experience. You might have a few applications. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Go um, for it. Final question, because conscious of time, you mentioned your fuck it fund. Yes. All right, and there'll be people in, the, in, in this room who manage budgets and P&Ls. Yeah. That might be interesting to them. How, how important has that fund been? How instrumental has it been in the development of Bremont and your product? Um, listen, you can't do that with everything because we do have a board <laughs> exactly, and they would yeah. sort of get, get, uh, get wind of it. I think it's been really interesting <laughs> for... Um, how do you stop them getting wind of it? I thought everyone wants to know. <laughs> I think the interesting thing early on, it allowed us to do stuff which... Um, you know, you, you know, a machine to machine a case is probably a million quid. Right. So that's one machine. So you're, you can't really put that through the fund. Yeah. But what you can do is say, right, I'm going to try finishing this movement here in the UK and not sending it out somewhere else. And it might be a machine which is 15, 20 grand. Yeah. And that would be in the, that fund. Right. We've got to stop swearing. Yeah. But that's, but, and then you say, actually, we can do this. Or polishing. Right. or And you can do it with the sort of smaller things. It's, so your, it's, your proof it's an R&D fund, really. Yeah, very good. Very good. OK, one, one more question. Um, what will it, you talked, actually, a very interesting story about how Switzerland came to be kind of dominant. Yeah. Much market. How does Britain get back into that position? What's quite interesting, our competition is Switzerland. I know um, in terms of the quality, in terms of how they produce. What's interesting about the UK is we can compete with Switzerland. You know, our cost base is lower than Switzerland. If you cost a living in, the UK, in Switzerland, it's mm. phenomenal. Yeah. Um, the problem is, you know, what we can't do is, and we're not trying to is compete with, you know, a lot of the watch brands that are having all their parts made in Asia. We're not trying to do that. Um, but we can. And what we, you know, what the Switzerland did um, in the sort of 1920s, 30s, is what they, they mechanized it. So instead of having the artisanal 10 watchmakers making 10 beautiful watches a year, which is the UK approach, yep. they said, actually, right, we're going to get that machine that's going to make 2,000 of those cases, 2,000 of those parts. And it became very, very good at it. Our approach at Bremont is very, very high tech. You saw some of the kit. It's really, really high tech. Yeah. That's the way we compete. So, because you can't have 20 people polishing one case, you have an automated CNC polishing, you know, set up, and yeah. then you hand finish it after that. And that's the way Switzerland. So we are nicking a few ideas from Switzerland. Yeah. But I do have one more question: Is e-commerce an opportunity or a threat for Bremont? A huge opportunity. Yeah. I think we have, we're always. It's got to be level playing field. You know, uh, we sell through a lot of retailers, yeah. and we're not trying to piss them off. Um, but if you can give that customer a better experience, and you know, if you're living in Alabama and your nearest mm -hmm. store is 100 miles away and you can get that watch shipped to you the next day or two days' time, that's, that's a benefit to the customer. Yeah. But we also work very close to the retailer where we'll say, right, actually, this lead is very close to you. Put that through to them. And yeah. I think it's a balance, and it's not yeah. about just um, it, it is about working together. Very good. Well, I'm very conscious of time, so I have to say thank you very much. Thank you. It's been an absolute thank you pleasure. very much, Steve. Thank, thank you. Very much. Take that. Thank you. Take that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.